Great. Well, welcome, everybody. Good afternoon, and thank you for joining this issue briefing on an important subject of the evolution of political Islam. One could be forgiven for thinking we look strictly at the long term here at the World Academic Forum with our theme this year of mastering the fourth revolution. But we'll say we have to have one mind firmly in the present and security and, and stability in the Middle East and North Africa region, as well as other regions elsewhere, is of paramount importance in 2016, just as looking forward to the future and the challenges we face in the, in the long term, looming on the horizon. So, political Islam, what does it mean? I have three experts, all diverse views, that hopefully will be able to explore this issue. We also have questions coming in from social media, and we also hopefully have questions from the floor too. Those of you unfamiliar with the format here of issue briefings, we have brief remarks by our three panellists and there will be time for questions and hopefully we'll have a slightly chaotic, free-flowing conversation. And I'd like to encourage all of you to butt in and, 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 and enter the conversation at any point whatsoever. We only have half an hour, it's not a great deal of time and it's an important subject, so we'll get started straight away. I'll just introduce my three panellists. I'm going to start by asking Mr. Ahmad Aravani, the President and Executive Director of the Centre for the Study of Islam and the Middle East in the USA. He's also a member of our Global Agenda Council on the Role of Faith, and he also teaches at the Catholic University in Washington, D.C. I'm going to start off by asking Ahmad about what political Islam means to him in 2016, and how it can be fully exploited to create a, an ideal political system. Asma Abu Mezid, a researcher and advancement fellow at Internet2, based in the Gaza Strip, I'm proud to say a member of our Global Shaper community in Davos for her first time. And you're, we're, I get to be asking Asma for her take on what the youth generation, the millennials, see as political Islam in its successful form. And again, we have another shaper, Yumna Nafal, who was also a member of the media, correspondent in, in Beirut for Future Television, a Lebanese channel. And I get to be asking her about the challenges, as she sees it, to political Islam, both in terms of perception, but also in terms of reality. Ahmad, if you would start, please. I'm very keen to hear your view on what is political Islam to you and um, how it can be best exploited. Thank you, and good afternoon, everyone. It's my great pleasure to be here today. Uh, in this very short time, I'll try to define political Islam the way I think and the way I understand it. Political Islam, um, I, before talking about political Islam, Islam by itself, unlike other religions, or at least unlike some religions, from the beginning, the founder of the religion was able, Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, was able to um, establish a, a government and be, build a political society, social society, a new life based on laws and rules. That led the Muslim after him, the Muslim followers after him, to follow his life and his example as an example for their own life and their societies. So they tried during the history by um, establishing Islamic states, by getting involved in a different part of daily life of the people, to show from religion, a religion that involves in every aspect of human life, including the political life of, of every person within Islam. So if we took this term as a general, that means Islam plays role in the political life of every, every Muslim, whether they have an Islamic state or not. Muslim highly encouraged to get involved in political life of their own uh, countries or their own nations. That's how political life in general means. However, some people, maybe some Westerners or some others, taking this term in a very narrow, uh, very narrow sense of that and applies only to part of Islam, trying to maybe disconnect or isolate the rest of the others, applying to those people who only seeking within the Islamic societies just to establish, even with force, even with fighting like the one what we see in ISIS and others to in, impose their uh, political views on others, even to non-Muslims, and that called political Islam. So it de depends really on from which perspective are you looking for, but from the way I look at it, Islam is integrated with politics, with morality, with everything. A Muslim person he has responsibility to uh, be active in every part of his life, including political matters. 
And the politics here, I mean a more general sense, as a, I'm looking at it as an art of uh, taking care of your daily affairs, which includes also uh, a political system, but is not limited to a political system, is more wider. And the body politics of each society is also part of this political Islam. Asma, what does it take? You're a, a different generation, of course. You've grown up in the Gaza Strip. You live in London, I believe, right now. Uh, DC, DC. Washington. Apologies. Yeah. Yeah. What's your take? How do, you, how do you agree with this perception of, of, of political Islam? Well, uh, to me, um, like when we talk about religion and politics, it's something that has been uh, talked about, like, and it has been in place since ages and since centuries as well. Uh, but the main, and, and for me, uh, when we talk about religion, it's about giving meaning to life. It's about the values, the reflection, the inspiration that guides our life. And when we talk about politics, we are talking about the rules and the policies that regulate our social lives. And like in, 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 in theory, these two things, when they work together, then we will have a really strong society that care to each other and it's inclusive. However, we should not neglect that there are also some people who interpret the religion in their own way and, and they use their religion as a way to attract people and to their own benefits. That's why we are saying this um, uh, uh, abuse of power, abuse of, of people intention as well. But as someone who actually grew up in Gaza and now is uh, living in DC, uh, what was more worrying for me is how uh, the Western uh, societies look at political Islam and at Muslims. I never feared all my life in Gaza, uh, other than the Israeli bombing, but like in normal life and in my interaction with the government, with Hamas, I never feared for my life. However, when I was in DC, which is supposed to be a free country, democratic country, in the first month, I had three accidents of harassment because I'm a Muslim and because my uh, Islam shows because of the way I dress. I had people harassing me by words, people coming to me in the bus and saying, are you going to blow up this bus? And uh, people also shouting at me and, and scaring me. So this is not only me. There are so many Muslims in their own countries and outside. They are being scared and, and worried about this reflection. So it keeps always wondering why the action of just a smaller group that does not represent the majority is actually generalized in the media, generalized everywhere. Why a, a, a human being does not take the effort to know the other, whether he's a Muslim, whether he's a Christian or any other religion. Yumna, maybe drawing on your role in the media, maybe drawing on your role as a global shaper, as a, as a young person. The, the, the viewpoints we've heard are, uh, are, are painting a picture of uh, a strong, inclusive, safe, caring society. And yet, as Asma says, there is, an, uh, a some, in some places, a, an image problem, if you will, with political Islam. It's, uh, it's not always interpreted in that way. Right. I, I just want to uh, add to what Mr. Yervani said and Asma. Uh, yes, political Islam, which if we were to define it, uh, a friend of mine, Tariq Osman, he's an Egyptian analyst. He defined it in a, in a way that I really liked. He said it was the implementation of and representation of Islam in society and politics. And today, when we look at political Islam, yes, it is facing somewhat of a crisis, uh, many challenges. Uh, and like Asma said, there is a group, if you will, of um, a loud group of people wrecking havoc in the name of Islam. Uh, they are spreading fear by using, by committing uh, atrocious acts in the name of Islam and scapegoating a whole community. But we cannot scapegoat a whole community of 1.6 billion people based on the loud actions of a group that seems to have completely uh, withered away from what Islam is supposed to be to start with. And to go back to what uh, you were saying about how in the U.S. Um, this idea of xenophobia, I mean, in the news today, we hear Republican candidate Donald Trump talk about wanting to ban Muslims from entering the U.S. And that's, you know, that can only create more terror because when you are going to tell a whole community, well, you can't come to the U.S., which is supposed to be the land of the free, it's going to perhaps drive 
more terror because you're excluding and you're 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 basically treating them as outcasts, which is not what it's supposed to be. You're supposed to. It's it's a difficult. I understand it's a difficult thing to try to um, get moderate people to talk to get. Uh, uh, moderate people who understand Islam and who are Muslims living every day like the rest of people going to their jobs uh, coming home to feed their children it's it's not just about what extremist groups do and I understand that it's hard for those moderates to get up and talk and speak up because a lot of them I think are scared of, of the reactions because of the, the, the constant portrayal of Islam in the media. So yes, there are challenges um, and uh, it's, it is a difficult time for political Islam, but I do believe that there is uh, hope in the future. I do believe that uh, today's topic is actually millennials and political Islam. And when we speak of millennials, we speak of those young people who started the Arab Spring five years ago by protesting, by using social media to call for reform and change. And um, uh, there was a very interesting uh, poll taken uh, last week, uh, but it's called the Zugby Research Poll Services Poll. And it basically uh, surveyed 3,000 and 754 Muslims, young Muslims, uh, men and women from the MENA region. And the, uh, the poll's uh, results were that three quarters of these young people feel that ISIS is a complete perversion of Islam and does not represent them. And they blame, a lot of them blame uh, their governments for these extremist groups and the failures of those governments. Which is very interesting when you think about it, because five years ago in the Arab Spring, and, and we had um, mm -hmm. Nobel Peace Prize winners from the, uh, the National, uh, National Dialogue Quartet this morning in this very same room talking about the, the, the experiences of building a multi-stakeholder coalition of business, of uh, civil rights activists, of, of, of labor unions, and, 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 and working together collectively to ensure a democratic transition. And there was lots of hope there in political Islam. Um, was perhaps not perceived the way it is today, and today it, it's different. So perhaps looking at that narrative, what, what has changed over that time? How come, how come the acts of ISIS have been allowed to dominate and overtake the narrative? If, if you allow me. Um, well, the problem is that when you talk about young people, um, when you don't empower young people to actually speak up, when you... Um, grow up in an environment where the only thing you have to do is just you have to follow the rules and not to have an understanding of what is happening, not to question things, not to think and have your own interpretation. So you will end up having the interpretation of the Islam or the religion by one group that is being dominating the whole spectrum or the society. And um, like, for example, in Gaza, um, religion was, it's considered the, like the, the gate for people to come out from the situation they are. And the problem in the Arab world is that there are so many factors influencing youth, uh, economic, political, uh, war, conflict. So um, there is no way they can have more voice in discussing things openly. That's why we are finding like people are suffering from extreme regimes, from oppression. And if you don't have these opportunities, it's not like the US or in Europe, you can speak your mind. Uh, so in, in, in such situation, it is, it is only an outcome that we are reaching to the status that we are have in the MENA region. I, I agree with what you said. And just adding to, to this, uh, I think that the, what we are witnessing today in the Middle East, which is now unfortunately full of crisis in different ways during the last few years, is related to many factors and have many causes, including the lack and crisis in the leadership of these countries, the political system they have, even they some of them they call political state, Islamic state, which is not really, we know that. And also the lack of job opportunities, economic crisis and problems which every day people are watching. And also the injustice 
which is happening in the region. Double standard policies, which is coming from everywhere, and, and, and people are uh, feeling it in their daily life, uh, making all these people to lose their hope more than before, to listen to some of the voices that they are calling themselves their true Islam and real Islam, and then to go to the situation that we are witnessing today. These people who are calling themselves like the Islamic State and they are saying whatever, I mean, whatever the others had, have done are not representing Islam and we are true Islam, they are taking advantage of this problem and defects within the Ummah, within the society of the Muslim countries. And then by that reason, you will see the thousands of people of the Muslim youth generation are leaving their homes and going there to become a martyr, to become, to become part of that Islamic State societies. That is wrong, but that's the fact. That is happening. So there are responsibilities. There are lots of responsibilities for Muslim scholars, for Muslim thinkers, for clergy, for imams, for West thinkers, for Western thinkers, for everyone to come, for business leaders. They have to contribute their shares. They have to pay their shares as well to come and bring education, bring job opportunities to the people. And in that time then, the education can play its role and, and give a new kind of understanding to these people that now embracing in a very wrong way the wrong slogans in the name of Islam in their life. And if I may add uh, to that, uh, it's uh, true that also Muslim scholars, they need to revise the way we interpret Islam because uh, Islam is actually a religion that fits every um, time. And it's uh, wrong to take the interpretation that fit um, uh, a century ago and implemented the same as now. Um, this is one thing. Another thing is that if you look at the people who are joining extremist group, they are joining because these extremist group are, are, living, are giving them purpose, are giving them a meaning, are actually including them, are actually valuing the, their drivers. It's the same, I was discussing that with a shaper, uh, Nadia, global shaper, and we were talking about this and we mentioned how, for example, why people are also joining gangs in the US while people are also joining extreme groups in different countries. It's not because that's, that's what they want. Nobody grow up and say, oh, I want to be a gangster. No one. Everyone has their own dreams. But when you are left with this only option, especially in countries where conflict is the constant thing that you grow up with, of course you will have tendencies of extremism. And if there is no one who can help you in actually dealing with these tendencies, then you will turn up to the only option that they have. And extreme group, it gives these people meaning. It gives them jobs. It gives them money. At least it helps them to have food on their table or in the f their family's table as well. I mean, just to add to what you both uh, were saying, if I may, it's, I agree there is a there's a sense of belonging that these young people are looking for, that they find in these extremist groups. And of course, uh, to blame is um, the society that they live in. Uh, it's not just, uh, what we didn't mention is that it's not just in Arab countries. A lot of people that are joining ISIS come from, you know, in Europe, for example, Belgium and France have a high number of nationals that are joining ISIS. Uh, you know, and now with the migrant crisis, we can't ignore that in the future, uh, there's going to be a significant Muslim population in Europe. I think 10% of Europe is going to be Muslim by 2030 or 2050. And there needs to be a dialogue for tolerance and mutual understanding and mutual um, coexistence, which is very important if things are to go forward, hopefully in a peaceful way. Um, uh, because yes, there are lack of opportunities. I don't. I don't think um, just that is going to allow somebody to go to extremist group. I think it's also what Asma said. It's they lure you with um, a, a better life, money, uh, the sense of belonging, which they're looking for as well. The youth. All the indicators are pointing towards economics here, aren't they? Whether it's a sense of belonging, whether it's of losing hope, because one doesn't have 
the job or the skills to, to succeed or to thrive and prosper. So I, I suppose my question is, how can we channel the positive aspects of Islam to create the institutions needed for this fundamental growth to take, to take root? At the World Economic Forum, of course, we publish competitiveness reports every year. We look at the long-term drivers of prosperity, the institutions that are required, the education, the environment. How can we channel Islam to help build this, this, this grassroots structure that we can build a prosperous society on? Mm -hmm. uh, before I answer your question, I just want to add something about these people who are joining ISIS from the Europe mainly. I think for these people, maybe job opportunities or whatever is an issue. But deeper than that is the way they have been treated in the West, especially in Europe. <coughs> there is a kind of marginalization that's happening to them. There is an issue, especially they are talking about us and others. They are others, they are in the corner. And when you have that kind of treatment with the community, with the immigrants, there is no kind of equal kind of treatment with each other, then you will feel that kind of reaction that led them to different kind of activities. However, so that's highly recommended for uh, European countries to try to bring them and, sh and try to integrate them within their communities and try to be a, a one family as a human being. Everyone has a dignity and that dignity must be acknowledged. That's something. Now about, I mean, how, if I understood your question that how we can channel, I mean, in the right way mm -hmm. um, that uh, I think that there are different, the time doesn't let us to go in details, but in short, there are different ways that uh, Muslim can contribute uh, in, in towards a better life for these people. Now, in terms of political leadership, there must be some kind of reshaping and rethinking of the, the political leadership of the region by giving the, their own people more opportunity to be part of the political system, uh, be a decision maker as a kind of a democratic society that the other people around the world enjoying them. Now the issue of education is highly, highly important and must be emphasized more than before. Now the education is not simply just providing new books or materials. No, those materials are very important and must be refined and rewritten by by modern reformist Islamic thinkers, which have come within the Islamic traditional system. If you brought them from outside, then there is a natural reaction towards them. So within the Islamic judiciary system, within the Islamic Sharia, within the Islamic theology, we need more kind of reform by using the term they are calling it ishtihad. That's also another one. Now, then it comes the role of civil societies, it comes the role of other countries mm -hmm. to get more involved with these people in the region. Unfortunately, I, I'm just coming from Iraq and the, I mean, I see that, I mean, they have been invested a lot on military aspect of this country, but there isn't any investment in terms of getting people involved with each other, try to educate them, try to connect them to the people around the world, to, to give them more hope they are hopeless. So the role of media here is very important. So encouraging peace, encouraging. So there are different kind of these issues that it, um, I'd recommend. I, to, to add on what he's saying, oh, may I? Please do. To add on what he's saying, um, he was talking about the importance of civil society and the importance of, uh, obviously, and of course, leadership is important, but um, if I could give the example of uh, France, which we were talking about, um, on the one-year anniversary of the Charlie Hebdo attack this January, uh, an organization called the French Council Muslim Faith, which was backed by the government, uh, held what they called an open mosque day, which allowed non-Muslims to go to, I think there are over approximately 2,400 mosques in France, so to go there to discuss with um, Muslims in the mosques, what the religion was about, what it entails, um, to, to kind of try to really uh, foster some sort of relationship that is based on mutual understanding, as opposed to, especially a, a year after the Charlie Hebdo attack, because it's still, in after November, it's still very fresh in people's minds. Mm -hmm. So those kinds of movements, those kind of events can help, 
there is damage that has been done, and we can't deny that. But um, is it repairable? Yes, I think so. Is it going to take time? Definitely. We I have a question from the can I just customer, add, of course um, you can. Yeah. So uh, I just want to stress about revisiting our own interpretation of uh, Islam and how we interpret Islam. That's very important. But also <coughs> I have another point is that, actually I'm telling this to the Muslims, can you please stop apologizing for the mistakes of a group that does not represent you? You are not guilty and it's not our fault. And these people like ISIS, when they commit the crime, they don't, they don't represent me. So why do I have the pressure on me to go and apologize? Don't apologize. You, you are only representing yourself. So if someone has an issue with ISIS, then they should direct this issue to ISIS, not to the rest of the Muslims. Um, another thing, uh, media should also stop being biased. Uh, when someone commits a crime, in, in, for example, in the U.S., and he's white American, he is um, categorized as having some psychological issues. But when a Muslim commits crimes, he's a Muslim, and all the Muslims will be doomed with him. And I think what we are seeing uh, by Trump is a, a, an example that talks about itself, like no one needs to explain that. And the third thing is that we also need to talk about political religion, not only political Islam. We also need to talk about political Christianity, political Judaism. It's all this religion. It's shaping our society. It is part of our society. It is part of how we behave in these societies. So we need to talk about this. We shouldn't focus on one lens because when we focus only about political Islam, we are actually reinforcing the ideas that, well, Islam is very extreme. These are terrorist people. That's why we need to talk about it a lot. We need to discuss it in the media. But we should also discuss other religions so that we can break the barriers and the misconceptions and the stereotypes that is all over the place. Just in the front row, please. Um, I just want to pick up on that point, and it's a question. Write your name, please, for the benefit of our audience. Sorry, uh, Peter Holmes Court is my name. I'm a writer. Question to all the panelists, but picking up on that point that you just made, political Islam is what we're talking about. I feel we're talking two different languages, although we're all talking English. When we talk about political Christianity, we talk about politics, a system for the people, being the most important part. When people are rising up and they're running Christian politics, they're saying that Christian should be the most important value. When I hear you talking about political Islam, you're still saying that the Islamic part should be the most important part. And that's where I'm having a trouble with understanding how you take some parts of Islam and say that's not true, that's not appropriate, that's not the right Islam, and this part is. Because religions are open, as you've said, to interpretation, to all time. So are we really talking about Islam or are we really talking about politics that governs people who are Islamic? First of all, I think, as you know, the history of Christianity, in, at least they are claiming that or there are lots of followers that there should be separation between church and state. Mm. That's something you cannot find it in Islam, at least among the majority of the Muslim. There is the integration of the religion and politics. You cannot make a distinction between these two. But however, to what extent? then the religion can play its role as a, as a political system to run a society and be a government. That's a, an issue over, has many different views, even among the Muslims. There are some Muslims who are part of, of, of supporting that Islam must be involved in, in politics as well. There is integration of politics and religion. Uh, by politics here, I mean the government, the state, which you can see it in Iran, for example in Saudi Arabia, in other countries. But there are some countries who are secular in terms of the governing the society, like Turkey or Egypt or others. But the society are Muslim. And in their daily life, politics plays a very important role as a Muslim. And they are not like, they don't say our religion is just for a personal issue in the closet. No, they are in daily life very active in a social and political life in the wider society. However, when it comes to the interpretation of Islam, you are right. I mean, in Islam, like any other religion, is open to different interpretation. No one can stop it. 
So, I mean, uh, the ISIS, they represent, they claim that they are representing of Islam. We are claiming that we are representing of Islam. Then here is like a battle, like a game that, uh, the wrestling, I can tell you, that we have to bring all our evidence, we have to bring all our culture and history of 1,400 years of rich culture that shows what we believe and what we claim. There is no other way. They have now, why I mean ISIS are grasping soft people attracting? Because they have the, the finest, the highest technology of media, they're using everything, they have money or whatever, brainwashing, and somehow they are winning the mind. So that's our responsibility of other Muslims, of 1.500 million or whatever we want to say, to come ahead and try to talk more. It is true, my dear sister Asma, that they are not representing us, but that's what we know. But for non-Muslim, for those who are just hearing in the name of Islam and they people are versing or reading Quranic verses, so from them they think they are the real Islam that is doing this. So you are right, it's our responsibility, our obligation to come ahead and try to clarify it and bring some proofs in different ways that this is... But not apologize, but not apologize. However, I mean, if they are doing it in the name of Islam, I think we should apologize from these people that this misusing of Islam created this kind of problem for well, this family or others. We were talking about that yesterday. Yes. I think there's a difference between condemning and apologizing. Apologizing means that you're guilty for what they're doing, but we're, you know. We are guilty in somehow, to be honest with you, in, in somehow we have worked less. I mean, I don't know. I mean, in that term, you can be guilty also if we don't care about our families, if we don't care about children, if we are not very active in our own societies, if we are not asking from our leaders, if we are not involved in our political system. So that gives room for them also to go ahead. So maybe a little bit guilty, but that's not a big issue to apologize who is guilty. That's now our daily responsibility to go ahead and try to work harder. Your uh, example, your presence here as, uh, as a young ladies or Muslim ladies, that is a good voice that's showing to the whole world that the Muslim women who, who are very successful in business and political life, that's the real picture of Islam on the Muslim woman. And that is how, as you mentioned, that was the, the life of the first lady of Islam, Hazrat Khadija Salam alayha. So we are proud of that and we have but to tell the whole people around the world. There are lots of um, ignorance uh, happening and, and people do not know really and they can make a distinction. So that's our responsibilities. Thank you. Well, we've run very, very slightly over time. I do apologize for all of those of you with busy schedules, like our panelists here. I think we've learned quite a lot in this past half hour. Islam can play a role in building the institutions needed for caring, inclusive, stable societies. It needs to play a role. Islam can retake the narrative, but it's going to take some time. I'd like to thank you all very much for joining us. I'd like to thank you all for joining us here in the room and for watching us live online. This session is now over. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.